Um, good evening and welcome to Narrative Medicine Rounds, hosted on this first Wednesday in February by the Division of Narrative Medicine in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center. Division of Narrative Medicine fortifies clinical practice by training practitioners to recognize, interpret, and glean insights relevant to patient care and clinician performance from the study of humanities, the arts, and creative work, helping all those interested in person-centered, respectful healthcare to deepen their self-awareness, clinical attunement, collaborative skills, and creative capacities through rigorous narrative training and practices. Whew, that's quite a sentence. Uh, my name is Michael Gately, and I work as an administrator for the master's program in narrative medicine at Columbia University. It's my great pleasure to host Andre Asiman, writer, teacher, and friend for a conversation about his new book, Homo Irealis, a collection of essays just published by Farrah Strauss and Giroux. There'll be links posted later for purchasing copies. Before I introduce Andre, I'm asked to note some Zoom rules. Please keep your microphone on mute to prevent background noise and know that you will be removed from the meeting for any disruptions. We're going to lock the event shortly so unfortunately, you'll not be able to rejoin if you log off or your connection is broken. But afterward, you will receive a link to the video recording. It is unlikely that we'll have to end this Zoom meeting suddenly, but if we do, check your email for a new Zoom link. Andre and I will speak probably for about 45 minutes to leave time for some questions. And please save them until then to type into the chat box. We'll post links at the end where you can order copies of his books to learn more about the narrative medicine program and the Department of Medical Humanities. Andre Asselman is a professor of comparative literature and the director of the Writers Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where several years ago I was a fellow in nonfiction writing and later his colleague. Many readers may know Andre through his novels, especially the worldwide bestseller Call Me By Your Name, which became a film, Eight White Nights, Harvard Square, Enigma Variations, and Find Me, a follow-up to Call Me By Your Name. Last summer, Penguin Classics published an edition of Dorothy Strachey's novel, Olivia, which he first read at 15. And in the introduction to the book that we'll be talking about tonight, he notes that one day he thought he'd like to write a novel like it that he'd call Oliver, but that eventually he changed his mind and called it by another name. Since the 1990s, in book reviews and in the essays that became out of Egypt, his memoir of the Alexandria of his parents and grandparents' generations, from which his family was exiled in 1965, Andre has been one of the most distinctive prose stylists writing in English. His essays range widely on the scent of lavender or the vanished 91st Street subway station, um, and they've been published widely. Many of them are collected in his books, False Papers, Exiles on Exile and Essays on Exile and Memory, and Alibis, Essays on Elsewhere. He edited Letters, and Letters of Transit and the Proust Project, in which writers introduce a favorite passage from Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. He sometimes teaches courses on Proust for high school students and graduate students, including Last Night at the Graduate Center. And when he was a professor at Princeton, he taught a seminar on Proust for 16 lucky freshmen, which is how we met the first Wednesday in February, 1994, 27 years ago today. Um, Homo irrealis is not a term in the DSM-5, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, or in Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, or as we'll talk about, I hope later, uh, Ricard Kraft Abing's textbook, Psychopathia Sexualis, um, but it's a term of linguistics. And Andre's publisher has helpfully uh, explained that irrealis moods are the set of verbal moods that indicate that something is not actually the case, or a certain situation or action is not known to have happened. In Homo Irrealis, Andre returns to the essay form to explore what the present tense means to artists who cannot grasp the here and now. Irrealis is not about the present or the past or the future, but about what might have been but never was, but could, in theory, still happen. Her meditations on subway poetry and the temporal resonances of an empty Italian street to considerations the lives and works of Sigmund Freud, Constantine Cavafy, Sebald, John Sloan, Eric Romer, 
Marcel Proust and Fernando Pessoa, and portraits of cities such as Alexandria and St. Petersburg, Homo Irealis is a deep reflection of the imagination's power to shape our memories under time's seemingly intractable hold. It's my great pleasure to welcome Andre Asaman. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and for counting all those years between <laughs> once, one time and today. Thank you. It does. It seems like yesterday um, yes. to me. Um, and I know that we've had many conversations over the years, um, and it's the first opportunity to speak publicly about some of your books. Um, the new book uh, is a sort of rich treasure trove of your reflections on artists and writers, and it's billed as a return to the essay form, I guess, after uh, your last two novels. But I, the first question that I want to ask is really, uh, have you ever left the essay form, or is it a place that you sort of have long felt yourself at home? Well, I, I think I write my novels as if they were essays. And I write my essays as if they were slightly novelistic. So I don't think there is a real line between the two because I move from one to the other. I like to think, but I like to think aesthetically. In other words, I like to think with thoughts that have feelings resonating from them. And, and that's what I focus on. So if I'm in a novel, I have a character feel something that I'm rendering into language. And if I'm writing an essay, I'm trying to also evoke in the reader some feeling that they have felt but have never quite considered. Is there a point at which you decide that what you're working on is going to be an essay or part of a novel? Yes, usually you, you, you know that you're going to drift into one direction eventually. When I started Call Me By Your Name, just to give you an example, I was really writing an essay on the house by Monet. I was going to focus on Monet. I wasn't going to write a novel, but I liked the house so much and the painting of the house that I said, you know, what if I put some people in it? And the next thing I knew I had a novel. I mean, it <laughs> took a few months, but. Um, and if I remember correctly, you were under contract for a different book at the time? That's right, that's right. I had, I couldn't, I was wasting my time. I, I, I basically I was having a hard time writing this book, which was long and difficult because it was too brainy. Actually, it was an essay. It wasn't really a novel. Uh, what happened is that I decided to stop for a while and just have fun with this house by Monet. And it just took over and I had to finish it at the end of summer because I was on deadline for the contract for the other book. So that was the end of Call Me By Your Name. I had to finish it. Um, so your summer lark is the one that happened to become the worldwide bestseller. Yeah, that's all it turned out. To. I wasn't even going to publish it. Well, thank goodness you did. I know that there are um, millions of people around the world who, um, for whom it spoke sort of very personally to them. Um, and I hope that they'll, some of them will find their way to your new book, which is also really very personal, um, even though it's, uh, or I shouldn't say even though, but as an encounter with works of art that you've written about and that have inspired some of your, your fiction as well as some of your essays. Um, I wonder if I could ask you to begin by reading um, a short passage from the introduction to Homo Realis, sure. um, and then we can talk about it. Now you so, do know from previous times that I read very poorly. You know that, right? You keep, you keep saying that, um, but I don't believe you. Okay, fine. All right, I'm gonna start. Okay, four sentences that I wrote years ago keep coming back to me. I am still not certain that I understand these sentences. Part of me wants to nail them down while another fears that by doing so, I will snuff out a meaning that can't be told in words. Or worse yet, that the very attempt to fathom their meaning might allow it to go into deeper hiding yet. It's almost as though these four sentences don't want me, their author, to know what I was trying to say with them. I gave them the words, but their meaning doesn't belong to me. I wrote them when attempting to understand what lay at the source of that strange strain of nostalgia hovering over almost everyone, over, sorry, everything I've written. Because I was born in Egypt and like so many Jews living in Egypt was expelled at the age of 14, it seemed natural that my nostalgia should have roots in Egypt. The trouble is that as an adolescent living in Egypt, in what had become an anti-Semitic 
police state. I grew to hate Egypt and couldn't wait to leave and land in Europe, preferably in France, since my mother tongue was French and our family was strongly attached to what we believed was our French culture. Ironically, however, letters from friends and relatives who had already settled abroad kept reminding those of us who continued to expect to leave Alexandria in the near future that the worst thing that could that the worst thing about France or Italy or England or Switzerland was that everyone who had left Egypt suffered terrible pangs of nostalgia for their birthplace, which had been their home once, but was clearly no longer their homeland. Those of us who still lived in Alexandria expected to be afflicted with nostalgia. And if we spoke about our anticipated nostalgia frequently enough, it was perhaps because evoking this looming nostalgia was our way of immunizing ourselves against it before it sprang on us in Europe. We practiced nostalgia, looking for things and places that would unavoidably remind us of the Alexandria we were about to lose. We were, in a sense, already incubating nostalgia for a place some of us, particularly the young, did not love and couldn't wait to leave behind. Thank you. Um, the expression of practicing nostalgia is sort of a theme that runs through some of your essays here and also earlier work. Um, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit about um, sort of this vision of, of France or what you describe as the fantasy France um, that departed from reality. Um, and then also, I wanted to ask you to read the four sentences themselves that gave you so much trouble. Um, and maybe we could sure. work to unpack a little of that. Okay. Well, these are the four sentences that I had written 10 years before. When I remember Alexandria, it's not only Alexandria I remember. When I remember Alexandria, I remember a place from which I like to imagine being already elsewhere. To remember Alexandria without remembering myself longing for Paris in Alexandria is to remember wrongly. Being in Egypt was an endless process of pretending I was already out of Egypt. So 10 years ago when you wrote that, um, was it you know, a kind of riddle to you that you were searching for an explanation? No, it made what it it made sense to me, it made total sense to me. But nevertheless, it's, it felt as if I had written them too fast and hadn't quite mastered what it means to be in a place looking to be elsewhere at the same time. Without adding the third step in the, in the, the whole formula is that you're in, I'm in Egypt thinking of being in Paris, but I already are anticipating when once I am in Paris that I will look back at Egypt where I was longing to be in Paris. I mean, it becomes a sort of cyclical spiraling thing. Yeah, I think of one of your other essays, um, you described it as arbitrage, mm -hmm. where you're sort of um, post thinking of thinking of how you'll look back on in the future on the thing that you're supposed to be experiencing in the present. That's right. Yeah. Um, and there were some sentences on the next page that you um, sort of with which you um, give greater explanation for how you found your way out of this um, this puzzle. And, and the I don't term think I reality. found my way out of it. <laughs> I never found my I'm still sort of struggling with it. But this is the sentence that I was, um, that is repeated in every single essay in one form or another. I was toying with a might have been that hadn't happened yet, but wasn't unreal for not happening and might still happen, though I feared it never would and sometimes wished it wouldn't happen just yet. And actually in the book, you print the sentence twice. So it might actually be worth hearing <laughs> twice. Do you want me to read it again? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Um, uh, yeah, I was toying with a might have been that hadn't happened yet, but wasn't unreal for not happening and might still happen though I feared it never would, and sometimes wished it wouldn't happen just yet. Thanks. And this is what you sort of came to learn was described as an irrealist mood? This is an irrealist mood because it's a mixture of 
what would be called the conditional mood. And uh, the conditional is not a tense and we're not gonna discuss linguistics, but it's a conditional mood tagged onto the subjunctive mood, tagged onto the optative mood, which is the should be. And, and so, and I think that fundamentally I exist on that level. That's my whole life is lived that way. Doesn't mean I'm not living in the present, but that my mental faculties are constantly building, sort of busy projecting something that is elsewhere when I'm in a very specific place. Yeah, no, I, and I think that you, over the course of the essays in the collection, kind of enact that really beautifully, especially in repeated encounters with works of art or films that you've seen many times and enjoyed or mm -hmm. works of literature. Um, I wanted to shift to the first essay uh, in, in this collection, um, which is called Underground. And I, I made reference to an earlier essay, with the same title about the 91st Street Station. But can, can you talk a little bit about what you describe um, in this chapter, which I think is a very helpful way of um, explaining repeated encounters with a work of poetry that you, um, you know, happen to see frequently in the subway and had somewhat of a different reaction to it with each encounter? Uh, well, it's because I like this poem and uh, I wasn't sure, and this is my feeling about all kinds of poetry that I read, modern poetry, which I still read, though with reluctance, because I never understand anything. I don't, I like to understand what I read. And here I was reading a poem that made sense only if I attributed some kind of sense coming from me, not from the poem, which is how I read, for example, Emily Dickinson. I don't understand exactly what she's saying. It's as if she's leaving spaces open for me to intrude and build my own understanding of the poem. And this is, this is a poem that I see in the subway. And I see it very frequently because their poems appear sort of consistently, but periodically they're always there. And I, I sort of, kept wondering, I developed a relationship with that poem. And it made me understand what may be this thing that I practiced during the day, which is some kind of literary criticism. And, I, and you will notice that all the essays are about an artist, but they all begin with my, in my sort of, how did I encounter this artist? And I still believe fundamentally that we have not yet come with an understanding of how to talk about a work of art as if we need to talk objectively about it, which is never true. We love a work of art and we don't know how to speak that love. So we camouflage it by pretending to be objective. I'm not saying you have to be subjective, but I do think that whatever you bring to a work of art explains the work of art to you. And that is the only way we can explain it. When I teach Proust, for example, I don't teach just Proust, I teach the Proust that I think is there. And I, I will take a step further and say that I misread Zebal, Proust, Cavafy, Pessoa. I misread them all. Not 100%, but significantly enough for them to reveal something that I am looking for and I'm gonna make them say it whether they've said it or not. <laughs> Um, it's sort of a mischievous uh, approach to literary criticism. Totally, totally. But at, <laughs> at least it's, it's far more insightful because you see things that only somebody like you could have seen. Mm -hmm. So that it's not like you are a robot reading a poem and writing criticism. You're a human being trying to find out what the equivalent human essence of the poem is trying to communicate or of the book or of the piece of music. Right. Yeah, no, and I think the, the experience that you describe in the subway of repeated encounters with a work that on its own terms may not be exceptional, but each perspective reveals a little bit about yourself um, is what's illuminating. And indeed many of the essays in this collection um, bring a kind of very personal approach uh, to, to criticism. Um, I wanna turn to, the, there's a, there are two essays in the collection on Freud and his mm -hmm. visits to Rome. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about your own experience in Rome and your own um, reading, maybe misreading of um, 
Freud, especially in, in terms of some of the art that you went to Rome to find and um, sort of sure. what you imagine Freud's uh, reaction to the I, same thing. I can't, I can't make Freud say something he never said, <laughs> but then I wonder why he never said it, you know? Right, right. Uh, you can do that. You can do that, especially with a person like Freud. If he doesn't say something, there's a reason why he's not saying it, when he should have been saying it. Anyway, I, I got to Rome when I was, what, uh, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I had just been kicked out of Egypt, and I landed in Rome. We were suddenly very poor. We had no money, so the family was helping us. And uh, it was a terrible time in my life because I didn't know what being poor meant, uh, but I knew that I had no money. So there was no way that I could have pretended I had the money, nor did I want to. Um, but I did one thing. I was given enough of an allowance to buy a cheap paperback every week. Every week I bought one paperback. I could only afford one, which is the equivalent. It was 400 liras, 600 liras was the equivalent of $1. So you figure out how much I had to play with. Uh, but I read a lot because among other reasons, I didn't like Rome, I hated Rome. And, and so I would sort of shut the shutters in the, in the room and read in sort of a penumbra uh, because I was trying to escape where I was. And I read so many books. In fact, some of the books that I still teach uh, were read back then. Um, so in, in a sense, when I go back to Rome, I'm looking for many things. And I go back to Rome, I used to go back to Rome when we didn't have the pandemic. Uh, I used to go back at least twice a year, sometimes three times a year, because I was always invited. And I love, I, I fell in love with Rome, of course, after two years, I was totally in love with the city. And I was reluctant to leave Rome because I knew I was never going to be living in Rome ever again, which I never have done. Um, and so- <laughs> But you said it could. It's a. It's one of the places that you could conceive of being a home. Yes, it, it might be my home if it wished to be my home, but it never really cooperated because I never really meant to live in Rome for more than a month. I've lived in Rome for a month at the most, and after that period, I can't wait to be back in New York, even though I like Rome more than I like New York. So you go figure that one. Uh, but I, I go back to Rome, and every time I'm back in Rome, I'm, I'm trying to understand who is back in Rome. Am I trying to walk in the footsteps of the young man I used to be, 14, 16, 17 years old? Or am I trying to be myself? Is there such a thing as just being yourself? As I'm walking in Rome, I am happy to be in Rome, but at the same time, I'm, I'm also realizing that I'm drifting into all the other times I've been in Rome with ex-girlfriend, with another girlfriend, with, you know, with all these experiences melding in. And, and they all are conflated one on top of the other, um, or not conflated, sort of imbricated one on top of the other, mm -hmm. to a point where I can no longer tell who is being in Rome. And I was thinking of Freud, who essentially, and we now call it the Roman uh, neurosis of Freud, because he went all over Italy, but kept avoiding going to Rome. And he knew this was a problem, avoiding going to Rome. And I was trying to eke out a meaning out of that possible avoidance of Rome. And he says, well, that's because I'm like Hannibal, who was also, by the way, a Semite, and therefore uh, didn't want to in, enter, never entered Rome. He got to Rome with his whole army, could have invaded Rome, but never did. And, and, and Freud says, well, maybe because I'm Jewish and uh, I couldn't really go to Rome because of the Catholicism and the whole, the, the anti-Semitic atmosphere that Rome had always exuded. Eventually he goes to Rome and he feels that he loves Rome and he goes back many, many, many times to Rome, from Vienna to Rome constantly because he loves it. Uh, and he always goes to visit a particular statue, which is the statue of Moses. He sees it every time he goes there. And he has written about the statue. So obviously it, it, it bothered him, it tormented him. And he was trying to understand what is the meaning of the statue. And I just took it to a next step. I said, if he's gone to see the statues, he would have gone to the museum of the Vatican museums. And therefore he would have seen this one statue that I particularly liked. And I was wondering why he never wrote about that statue. And I make a, a, a sort of a corresponding 
uh, assumption that if he never mentions that statue, which he must have seen, and he must have gone there with the head archaeologist, archaeologist and classical scholar, Louvi, uh, who was his friend from Vienna since their school days, there must have been a connection. But why does he not mention that statue? There is no reason why he doesn't mention it because he might not have interested him, but I'm sure that he avoided mentioning it because I was attracted to that statue. Right. And I was attracted to the statue of Apollo because it was a beautiful statue, a beautiful, handsome young man. And I was totally sort of mesmerized by it. And, and so I was trying to understand. And, and so I alleged, because I'm conscious enough and honest enough to know that I'm just alleging, that he avoided mentioning that statue because he was himself attracted to it. And the only assumption I can make is because Winkelmann, who was the man who basically brought those statues, many of those statues to, to the Vatican Museum or to Cardinal Albani's villa, uh, Winkelmann, who was so essential to Freud, who had written about Rome so much, and Freud had read him. Why does, Winkelmann, does Freud never mention Winkelmann? Why does he totally avoid it? And yeah. that is impossible. If you're a Roman fanatic and you love Roman archaeology and Roman art, you have to write about Winkelmann, and he doesn't. So I'm yeah. saying there's got to be a reason. No, it's a it's a beautiful essay um, about your interest in the Apollo Seroctonus, the lizard slayer, um, and the episode that you describe uh, with the statue and also um, this. Uh, sort of, I guess, medical textbook about sexual deviance. Um, oh God! Sort yeah. of. <laughs> um, it it sort of seems to contain some seeds that you've sown uh, in some of your other other work. Um, you know, as a kind of formative experience on the on the bus. Uh, can oh, you talk yeah. a, a little bit about um, you know what that what that was like? Um, sort of when you were, I guess, about fifteen or sixteen. Yeah. No. Um... Basically, when you read Kraft Ebbing, which is it was a classic, it still is a classic, and you can still find it. My edition of it, which I bought again many times, but the last one I bought was printed in India, of all places, uh, where they pirate books all the time. Um, but it was, I would read Kraft Ebbing. There was a huge tome in one store that I used to go to. You could sit at a table and leaf through that tome for as long as you wished. And I read every single sort of sexual problem that people have. I don't want to call them deviancy because, but everyone I read was erotic enough to, for me to say, oh, I have that too. You know, uh, you're attracted to X, I have that. I'm attracted to this, I have that too. Uh, every malady that you could think of, some of them are really sicknesses. I can, you know what, I don't have it yet, but I could have that, <laughs> you know. Um, it's like reading the, the horoscope and reading all 12 of them and say, yeah, each one of them is me. Um, and after reading that, you're so filled with desire and you go on a bus and somebody comes behind me uh, on a bus and he sort of holds me because it's such a crowded bus. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is happening. I don't believe this is happening. Somebody's holding me. I don't dislike it. And so I'm, I'm just quant asking myself, do I want this to go on? Yeah, I don't want it to stop. He, it's the, the man behind me, is not sort of letting go. But eventually he does let go and he moves elsewhere in the bus. And I'm saying, God, am I really disappointed? Yes, I guess I am. Uh, you don't know where you said, but I love the fact because later on that day, I had a girl who came to our house for my mother to give her shots. My mother used to be a nurse and she had dinner with us and everybody thought, knew she was in love with me and they were wondering why I wasn't in love with her. I wasn't. But eventually I was thinking of her and of him and the bus and I mixed them up. And of course, later at night when you're by yourself, you know, you, whatever it is that you want to think about or do, you do it and you are, I was totally confused between one and the other. But I love that because that was the irrealist moment in my own life where I was this or that, or I wanted both. I wanted, didn't want one didn't want the other either. And yet here I was getting all aroused, thinking of both of them. What is happening? You don't know. And I yeah. think the one allegation I make about everybody on this planet, and I think when you're a writer, you can make that assumption and you could be proven wrong, is that 99% of people are living in the area of zone themselves. 
everybody is everything and is everywhere and constantly elsewhere. Yeah, and the experience that you described, um, I think resonates with some of what we know about you know, Ilio and his attractions and call me by your name. Sure, of course, but that's, I mean, I borrowed some of it from there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, sort of this lovely routine that you had with your father each week um, when you were living in Rome, uh, where you would sort of be exposed to some of the books that he had read. Um, and in addition to uh, Proust, who I guess was, you were not quite taken by on first encounter. Um, no, I stopped reading Proust because my father said, you should read Proust. It's the best thing there is. And I started reading it and I said, oh, this is what I have nothing left to say in my life if I read more <laughs> of this. So I stopped reading it right away. It stuck, struck a little too close to home. Too close, far too close. Um, well, one of the uh, sort of things that I learned um, in the essay on Kabafi was that it was really in Rome that you discovered Constantine Kabafi, sort of famous poet of Alexandria. And it was at that point when you were already sort of had been in exile from Alexandria in Rome that you started um, to, to sort of think most deeply about what you had lost from Alexandria. Yeah, well, I mean, in Alexandria, as in the rest of the book, whenever I speak about myself, there's always a sense that a part of me and that I use the picture of myself in Alexandria as a metaphor for that. A part of me stayed in Alexandria and never left. And basically, I don't know who of us do, me or the part who left, stayed back, is the real me. And there's always a sense of competition between the two of us. The one who's there is the real me, and I'm just faking being myself because I had to adapt to Italy, then to France, and then to the United States. Or is the adapted one the real me? And this other one, the authentic, allegedly authentic me, is basically just a figment. Uh, I don't know that, but when I read Cavafi and when I read Lawrence Durrell and then Cavafi, I realized that, God, this city that I used to hate obviously is the center of a sort of very um, arcane and uh, very profound culture. How come I didn't do any of those things that people are supposed to be doing all over Alexandria? You read the, the Alexander Quartet and you feel that these people are living a life that I wish to live. What am I doing being this kind of straightforward person living in Rome, going to school when I could be dissolute, which is something that I've always thought I should have been, but never was never dissolute in any respect. But Alexander became this capital of dissoluteness and I was a citizen of it, but in exile from it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wouldn't want to go back to Alexandria in, in that particular way. But in reading Kabafi, I realized that here is a person who already was nostalgic for an Alexandria while he was in Alexandria, mm -hmm. which reminds me of that wonderful poem which a critic in India read sent to me. You know, it's a basho uh, haiku. You know, in Kyoto, I remember the plums of Kyoto while still in Kyoto. In other words, you 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 are in a place you long for the place, and at the same time you're not there because you're already nostalgic for it, which is exactly the irrealist mood, if you want. Mm -hmm. And Kavafi, I would say, he goes, uh, there's a famous poem that he wrote about revisiting a, an apartment he used to have where he used to make love to his lover. And now he goes back again and he finds that it's become a business office. This used to be the bed, there was a pot there, there was this there, it's no longer there, there are desks here. Uh, and then I decided, Kavafi couldn't have written that poem without thinking. One day I will come back, even though I'm in bed with my lover, one day I will come back here and lament the fact that the lover is gone, that this place has become a, an office. In other words, the poem does not say that he's going to anticipate returning to it. I make him say that because that's how the poem makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I want everybody who reads me to now basically corrupt the poem and read the poem as I want you to read it. So you're uh, making a willful misreading of the poem? It, it's not that, it's not a misreading 
to be honest, it's there except Kavafi never saw it. And, and I'm just making him say it. I'm not saying he would have said it, he didn't say it, but I'm saying it's inscribed in the poem. I'm seeing it. Yeah. The biographical me is seeing it. The biographical me has become now a critic and is basically saying, this is what I see. Yeah. And this um, sort of biographical critic is an approach that you bring also to the three essays on Romare, the films that you include in the, um, in the, in the collection, where, which has had obvious influence in some of your fiction. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what your relationship with Romare was and why those films were important to you um, when you saw them, I guess, in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, we well, see, basically, I'm a young man. I'm 20 years old. I've been, I've been abandoned by this girl I was totally in love with. And uh, I'm going to see a movie about a young man who is in his 30, he's 34 years old in the film, but he's already uh, had all the, the women he needed to love. And now he's become a good Catholic and is no longer in search of, of women. He just wants to get married to a wonderful and probably Catholic woman. That's what he wants. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, I, I don't understand this. Here I am wanting to have more experience, wanting to be loved and to love more women than, I've, than I have had. And here is a man who's abandoning this. I want to be this man, but I don't want to be this man at that age when you're already abandoning the pursuit of pleasure. And of course, that was a whole sort of myth that I was making up in my mind. But underneath that myth, the, the Eric Romer's films are basically about moments that I perceive are, could only happen in France mm -hmm. and could only happen in a particular kind of France where people are very educated and yet at the same time extremely urbane and don't push their education on you as if it's something to be proud of. They just live their education. They talk about Pascal over dinner at Chris, on Christmas Eve, which is a lovely moment. It's a wonderful conversation. And then I saw there's something else going on here. This man is in bed with this woman. He is, of course, sitting on the bed, wearing his suit. He told her he's not going to sleep with her. She says, you know, you're an idiot. But he decides not to sleep with her. And they're talking about life. And she says to him, you know, I've never spoken to somebody like this in a very long time. And I love speaking like, about these things to you. And of course, they're far more intimate out of bed, though they are in bed, than when the sexual act occurs. And I said, this is very disturbing to me. I don't understand it. And so I'm trying to make sense of that. And I find that in Romer's movies, there's always an other thing, sort of sitting or standing laterally next to the woman in question that he's after, but he doesn't know what it is. In, Romer, in My Night at Maud's, he will step out of that apartment with that woman after not making love to her and run into the woman that he's going to marry. In Claire's knee, it's, it's, he sees this beautiful girl, but it's not the girl he wants. He wants, or at least he tells himself, that he wants her knee, okay? In Chloe in the afternoon, it's not Chloe that he wants to sleep with, even though she's naked in bed waiting for him. It's basically his wife that he wants to go back to. In other words, the, they always have something else going on in their lives, something more alluring, which they may have, but they don't know that they have. You say that um, this is sort of a fantasy France, and but one that you transplanted to New York in Eight White Nights, it yes. sort of takes place in a, amidst a, a, a Romero film festival. Yes, it does. And I, I, I was totally conscious of what I was doing. Basically, I, I was saying that there is, there are moments in, in Eight White Nights, and I don't want to talk about that book right now, but I will say this, it's about a relationship that springs between two individuals who are very experienced, they've had many love affairs, they're both quite sort of very sophisticated people who meet and they meet every night at the Romare Festival. Uh, and usually not planning to be there, they just coincide there and they make a point of meeting the other there without saying that they're intending to do so. And, and they don't sleep together. And at some point she makes a pass at him and he says, you know, I'm not ready yet. 
Uh, and she's like, okay, fine. So she goes upstairs <laughs> and he walks back and he sits and mopes, of course. And he keeps moping for two or three more nights. Not a good idea, but essentially he's after something else. He's after what you might call the romance that exists between two individuals, which is the most magical thing because it is filled with promise, filled with magic and filled with a kind of unintended uh, but unavoidable intimacy between two individuals, which is the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah, no, and it's something that you've um, beautifully expressed in your own fiction. There was one passage um, where you speak of reading Proust in the 70s through the lens of Romer, sort of, I guess, as you're uh, studying uh, in graduate school at, at Harvard. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the essays on Proust and some of the scenes that you you mentioned in Homo Irrealis, um, and also spend a little bit of time just talking about the the sentence, the Proustian sentence, which I think you liken to um, a, a souffle with the uh, sort of turning and turning uh, to sort of pro prolong it. Well, um, the idea of the souffle. I'll start with the idea of souffle and work back to Proust. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, because I use the souffle to explain. Beethoven, which is totally unfair, but it makes sense to me. The idea of the souffle came to me when I was writing this particular sentence. Uh, it's the very sentence I've read twice. You made me read it twice, but I will read it one more time. Uh, because if you think about it, it's, and if you think about what a souffle is, let me just go to it. Of course, I can't find it. Uh, here it is. I was towing with a might have been that hadn't happened, but wasn't unreal for not happening and might still happen, though I feared it would never happen and sometimes wished it might happen, but knowing that it wouldn't made me want to and I can go on forever. This is the kind of sense that doesn't stop, but what it does is it folds on itself this way, which is exactly what Julia Child says you should do when you're preparing a souffle, you take the air, the, the, the what do you call it, the egg white, and you fold it in its, uh, on itself, on and over and over and over again. But it's the same, basically, series of clauses that can be um, put together indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And that is how I came to the idea of the um, of the sentence and the souffle metaphor. But then of course that came to me, why? Because of Proust. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the, th I've written an essay on Proust once um, where, where, because Proust basically starts his sentences as I always like to say, with a kind of elegy, it's, it's sort of a lyrical beginning. And then he goes into a mo in the middle of the sentence, which is amplified and magnified and is full of air and full of sometimes unnecessary stuff. But what it does, it keeps the expectation of closure coming and it doesn't quite come. And so it builds tension, even if it's just in a description of a dress or of a flower. In other words, very insignificant stuff. But what he keeps doing is building and building and building as you would with a souffle with air. And suddenly at some point, he, he allows it to collapse into something ironic. So he starts with elegy and he ends up with irony. And I think I've discussed that with you in the seminar many, many times. But the, the idea is that um, Proust likes to defer arriving to something. He puts off the moment of arrival. And I've always given writers, when I used to give advice to writers, is if you're writing a sentence, the dog bit the postman, instead of putting a period there, which would make sense, just put a comma. And by putting a comma, you're forcing yourself, sort of, you're forcing yourself to say, okay, something else needs to be said here, not just, and the postman was bleeding, okay? You need to add something else. And that's what Proust does. He keeps putting commas, comma. I mean, he doesn't do it with the purpose of putting a comma, but I'm saying that so if you look at it graphically, it's a comma building on something else and generating something else. And you keep writing so that you don't get to the end. This is my souffle sentence. You can keep extending it forever so that you don't have to take a position, so that you don't have to come with certainty because certainty is sort of, to some people, it is scary. 
you're mm -hmm. vulnerable to certainty. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to know things. You don't, at least you don't want them spelled out to you. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, there's a kind of life that is sustained by the continual sentence that comes to the end at the, at the period. Yeah. Um, we have a, um, not an enormous amount of time left and I wanted to talk a little bit about the last essay in the book, which is, it's titled Unfinished Thoughts on Fernando Pessoa. And um, I thought it was sort of brave to include a kind of unfinished essay or what appears to be an unfinished essay as the last in the selection. Um, it begins with a kind of arresting metaphor of um, you know, this story of a, well, you, you I'm sure could tell it better, better than I can of um, the painter who goes in search of a model for the boy Jesus and then later in life goes in search of a model for uh, the apostle Judas. And, and finds out that the, the person he's painting is Judas. That took him 20 or so years later. He sees that the man is crying. He says, why, you look like a derelict. Why are you crying? He says, because you painted me as Jesus. And that was a story that was told to me by my father. And then I realized, oh my God, this story, and it stayed with me for the rest of my life, that story, because it's, it told me that even though I was a little boy then, I could become sort of the, the Judas. I could become a derelict. I could become sort of a bedraggled human being. I could sink to the lowest levels of everything. There was like moral turpitude already embedded in me and I wasn't even aware of it. I didn't even know what the sins that I was going to commit were. Okay, and, but that, and I use that metaphor to explain something about Pessoa because Pessoa never says that he knows who he is. As I like the beginning of the book is, I am the in between, uh, what, how does it go? It's a, the sort of enigmatic epitaph. I am the gap between what I am and what I am not. Yes, I'm the gap between what I am, okay, and what I am not. How could there be a gap between the two? There's no such thing. But he does that constantly. He basically, he twists language in such a crafted manner that he's always unraveling things that we expect to be normative and certain. He finds basically moments of identity where identity is itself incapable of conceiving what identity is. And I, and I love this about him. Uh, most people who write about Pessoa always write about the heteronyms, the fact that he had so many um, al 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 aliases, if you want, and they all wrote very beautiful stuff, but very, very different one from the other. So they had totally different personalities. And people like to write about this. I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in Pessoa, the man who was basically um, is doing this weird archaeology into fundamental paradoxes that explain how we live or how, let's say, how we don't know how to live. As in, my, in the closing lines of my essay on, on Zebalt, if I may close it, uh, if I can find it, if I do we have time, yeah. uh, I, I can't find it. Page okay. 88. Oh, is that it? Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's go to page 88, yeah because time doesn't really understand time the way we do. Time doesn't care because time couldn't care less how we think of time because time is just a limp and rickety metaphor for how we think about life because ultimately it isn't time that is wrong for us nor for that matter it is place that is wrong for us. Life may be wrong for us. I've said maybe but actually I wrote, life is wrong for us. No, it's a, no. yeah, it's a- I don't know if life is wrong for us. No, it's a pretty severe sentence and I, I don't want to end on that one. So let's, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to turn to, um, in, sort of in the essay on Pessoa, you mentioned this, this photo of yourself at 14. Yeah. Um, that you, if, if Renee is able to share it now, um, I wanted to ask you to read the passage from the introduction on page 11 where you you talk about this picture of yourself the last that was taken of you in Egypt as a child and sort of imagine a conversation with uh, the boy that you might have become yeah. and while Andre is doing this if um, our guests want to put some questions into the chat 
and we'll see if we have some time for that at the end. This is going to take about four four minutes. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. So the section from eleven to the middle of thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. A picture that my father took of me is my last picture in Egypt. I was scarcely 14. In that picture, I am squinting and trying to keep my eyes open. The sun is in my face and I'm smiling rather self-consciously because my father is chiding me and telling me to stand up straight for once while all I'm probably thinking is that I hate this desert uh, oasis about 20 miles from Alexandria and can't wait to be back and heading to the movies. I must have known that this was the last time I'd ever see this oasis again. There is no other picture of me in Egypt after that one. To me, it represents the last instance of who I, I was two to three weeks before leaving Egypt. As I stand there in my typically reluctant, undecided posture with both hands hiding in my pockets, I have no idea what we're doing in this desert outpost or why I'm letting my father take my picture. I can tell my father is not pleased with me. I'm trying to look like the person he thinks I should be. Stand straight, don't wince, look decisive, but this is not me. Yet now that I look at the picture, this is who I was that day. I trying to become, to, to be someone else or caught ever so awkwardly between who I didn't like being and who I was being asked to be. When I look at the, at the black and white photo, I feel for that boy of almost six decades ago, what happened to him? Whatever did he end up becoming? He isn't gone. Perhaps I wished he were gone. I've been looking for you, he says. I'm always looking for you, but I never speak to him. I seldom ever think of him. Yet now that he's spoken, I've been looking for you too, I say, almost by way of a concession, as if I'm not sure I even mean what I've just said. And then it hits me. Something happened to the person I was back then in that picture, to the person staring at the father who is ordering him to stand straight up adding as he was so frequently did a cutting for once as if to make certain his criticism landed where it hurt. And the more I look at the boy in the picture, the more I begin to realize that something separates me from the person I might have become had nothing changed, had I never left Egypt, had I had a different father or been allowed to stay behind and become who I was meant to be or even wanted to be. It's the person I was meant to be or could have become that continues to rankle in my mind because he's right there in the picture, but ever so hidden. What happened to the person I was actually working on becoming but didn't know I was about to become because one never quite knows that one is indeed working on becoming anyone. I look at the black and white picture of someone over there and I'm tempted to say, this is still me, but it's not. I didn't stay me. I look at the picture of the boy posing for his father with the sun in his face and he looks at me and asks, what have you done to me? I look at him and I ask myself, what in God's name have I done with my life? Who is this me who got cut off and never became me the way I cut him off and never became him? There we are. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. You're welcome. See if there are any questions in the chat. No questions. That's okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you said you don't give, give advice to writers anymore. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what advice you've gotten from editors uh, over the years. Editors have always uh, basically have been very nice to me. I've had very aggressive editors, which I like a lot. I'm the kind of author that you can say, don't say this. And I would say, yes, you're right. Uh, very, very seldom have I disagreed with my editors. And I think this is a good thing. An editor is basically taking something that you that comes from your heart and has maybe have some of the fat from your heart be removed uh, so that it becomes more, placeable, more readable, more sort of speaks to more people than the, the few people that would really understand and need the agglutinations that come from your inside. 
Um, on the other hand, I've always given advice to writers and I always say the same thing. Most writers who are young want to be published. And so they end up writing the way they see people are being published, right? And what I'm saying to people is no, find, read the classics, learn to understand what the classics did. Don't imitate them, but at least have a sense of the longevity and the, 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 so the enduring craft of writing that has been passed on from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Lodge yourself in that line, not among the contemporaries. You'll sound like every other contemporary, which is basically a condemnation. Yeah, you might even be successful as a contemporary, but that's not, are you just somebody like somebody else? Or do you come with something that makes you stand out because you've understood life, not your experiences of life. You've sort of reasoned with the chaos inside of you and come up with some vestige of an understanding. That is what every person has to contribute, not just write like everybody else, go to a, what do you call it, a creative writing program and learn to write basically like a creative writing program would teach you to do. And I was the, of course, the, the runner. I, I created my own creative writing program. And of course, I don't teach in it because I'm smart enough not to teach, but- um, You found the most talented editors uh, yes. to hire. Yes, yeah. I did. I hired the most talented editors in the country, basically, to come and teach. And uh, they have made many, many people very successful, but they are also very sensitive to what a classic text has to bring. Yeah. You know, and I think the advice to write sort of from within yourself is abundantly evident in your own writing. Um, it's so distinctive, but of course, informed by your encounters with a lot of the classics. Um, <laughs> Whom I misread. Well, uh, we can talk more about that next time we see each other in person. Um, but for now, I wanted to in implore everyone uh, to buy a copy of Humboldt Realis and links from where you can purchase Andre's book should be uh, shared soon on your screen. Wanted to thank Andre for this conversation, for joining us tonight, and to announce that a recording of the event will be shared later this week by email to everyone who registered. And then we hope to see everyone next month for March Narrative Medicine Rounds when we welcome artist, design researcher, and writer Sarah Hendron, who teaches design for disability at Olin College of Engineering. Sarah will speak to us about her latest book, What Can a Body Do? It was named a 2020 Best Book of the Year by NPR and Lit Hub. So hope to see you all then. Thank you again. Andre thank you, Asimov. Michael. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Columbia University. You're wonderful. You've always been wonderful. Thank you so very much.